Our thanks to Tracy as you bring to us our reading. The reading today is from Revelation 10, starting at verse 1, which can be found on page 317 of the New Testament towards the rear of your Bible. Angel and Little Swell. Then I saw another mighty angel coming up down out of heaven. He was wrapped in a cloud and had a rainbow around his head. His face was like the sun, and his legs were like pillars of fire. He had a small scroll open in his hand. He put his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. He called out in a loud voice that sounded like the roar of lions. After he'd called out, the seven thunders answered with a roar. As soon as they spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice speak from heaven. Keep secret what the seven thunders have said. Do not write it down. Then the angel that I saw, standing on the sea and on the land, raised his right hand to heaven and took a vow in the name of God who lives forever and ever. Who created both heaven, earth, and the sea, and everything in them. The angel said, There will be no more delay. But when the seventh angel blows his trumpet, then God will accomplish his secret plan. As he announced to his servants, prophets. Then the voice that I heard speaking in heaven spoke to me again, saying, Go and take the open scroll which is in the hand of the angel standing on the sea of the land. I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, Take it and eat it. It will turn sour in your stomach, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from his hand and ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. After I swallowed it, it turned sour in my stomach. Then I was told, Once again, you must proclaim God's message about many nations, races, languages, and kings. I was then given a stick that looked like a measuring rod and was told, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count those who are worshipping in the temple. But do not measure the outer courts because they will have been given to the heathen, who will trample on the holy city for forty-two months. I will send my two witnesses dressed in sackcloth, and they will proclaim God's message during those twelve hundred and sixty days. The two witnesses are the two olive trees, and the two lamps that stand before the Lord of the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May my words and the thoughts of all our hearts make sense in your sight, O Lord, our God, and our rescuer. Amen. Getting on for 3,000 years ago, there was a drought in Israel, with no doubt wildfires striking out. And in the third year of the drought, the prophet Elijah went to the king, Ahab, Elijah, you troublemaker, roared the king. See what you have done. The crops have died. The wells are dry. There's a great drought and it's your fault. No, your majesty, said Elijah, the fault is yours. For you've not obeyed the Lord God and lived wisely. The Lord God? Ha! Snapped Ahab. I don't have to listen to what he says. I follow the God I want to. It's a matter of freedom. What right have you got to tell me what to say? All right then, answered Elijah. 
Why don't we have a contest to prove once and for all who the true God really is? And so they did. On the top of Mount Carmel, overlooking the sea, prophet Elijah stood on one side, and 450 prophets of the god Baal stood on the other. And the people of Israel, a great crowd, gathered below to watch. The prophets of Baal went first. They stacked up a pile of wood. They killed a bull and laid it on top, and they prayed to Baal. They asked him to send fire on the whole thing. That's quite easy, wasn't it? Fires were breaking out around the place. They prayed hard. They prayed long from breakfast to lunchtime, but no fire. Fire everywhere, but no fire here. Not a spark. So they prayed louder, but it made no difference. By the middle of the afternoon, they were exhausted. That's when Elijah took his turn. He piled up 12 stones to remind them of their history, the tribes of Israel. He laid wood on top of that, then the bull, and finally poured water over the whole thing. Wouldn't you like to have water poured over you now? <laughs> the crowd was amazed. How will it ever catch fire? But Elijah knew just what he was doing. Lord, he prayed, you are the real God and not some statue made of sticks and stones. Show your people now so they will follow you again. Elijah had barely opened his eyes when it happened and God sent fire from heaven that burned up not only the bull but the whole lot. The Lord is God, the people shouted. Hooray for Elijah! And the crowd chased away the prophets of Baal, and they soon ran for cover themselves as there was a great storm and it started to rain. But the royal family were out to get Elijah, so he fled and he went to that place where the great Mo prophet Moses had met with God, to Mount Horeb, to Mount Sinai it's often called, the place where Moses had received the Ten Commandments. Where there had been thunder and lightning and storm-like trumpets, God will meet me here, God will protect me, he thought to himself. And he wanted Ahab to be struck down with fire and brimstone. And he went to the mountain, and there was indeed a great storm, and a great wind storm ripped stones from their roots, plunging them down the mountain. And Elijah thought, God is with me. But God was not in the wind. And a great earthquake came and turned the earth. And Elijah thought, yes, God is with me. But God was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, great bolts of lightning, of fiery lightning. And now, I yes, Elijah thought, God is going to strike down the king just like that bull. But this time, God was not in the fire. And after the storm and the earthquake and the fire and probably trumpet sound like as the wind blew through the mountain, after all of that, there was an awesome silence, a still, small voice of calm, as some have translated it. And in that silence, Elijah heard and met with God. You know that awesome meeting with God. The media tell us, feel the magic as they try to imitate it, but come nowhere close. God wants us all to know that awesome presence of God. Bill Burnett was Archbishop in South Africa. And he believed, he said, in the theology, but not so much in God, in his heart. And he preached at a confirmation service on Romans 5, God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. And after he had preached, he went home and poured himself a stiff drink. But then he felt God saying to him, go and pray. So he went to the chapel. And as he prayed in the chapel, he sensed God saying, 
I want your body. He was a bit surprised, because as he said to himself, he was not Mr. Universe. But he said, Lord, I, I give myself all to you. And he said, what he had preached about that morning happened. He experienced electric shocks of love and found himself on the floor and the Lord saying, you are my son. And from that moment on, his life changed and many through him came to know the love of God poured out in their hearts. John, the poet of Revelation, whom Tracy read to us, knows all of this, the awesome experience of God's presence. And in John's vision, as we have crept up on chapter 10, there has been a great drought. There has been fire burning up the vegetation. There have come great trumpets of a storm, the roars of thunder, earthquakes and fire. Is our God not a mighty God? The God who created heavens and earth. Is it not dangerous to live in a world such a creator God has made, where creation itself speaks of God's majesty and awesome might? The heavens and the earth proclaim the glory of God, Psalm 19. And Elijah, exiled on Patmos, perhaps thought to himself in his vision, this is the moment, like Elijah, he thought, God is going to take vengeance on my enemies, on the enemies of the churches in East West Turkey that I love. God will intervene and rid us of all that plagues us, of the all that stresses me out every day, that overwhelm me and those I love. And John sees a mighty angel, the angel of God's presence. One foot is in the sea. Goodness, this is mighty. John thinks of God's presence with the Israelites as God opened up the waters of the Red Sea through which they travelled when God delivered them from Egypt and led them to the Promised Land. And one foot is on land, reminding God, John, of the pillar of fire by which God led the Israelites through the desert. And he sees that this angel is preaching a sermon with one foot planted in the ocean and the other on the continent. The sermon the like of which he has never seen or heard before. And from this comprehensive land and sea pulpit, the angel is preaching from a book, a sermon explosive with thunder. Thunderous judgment. This was a sermon no one would sleep through. Wake up at home. And John started to write down what he was hearing. He'd never heard a sermon like it, a sermon of God's might and power and thunderous glory. And he had his notebook to hand. His iPad was there, his iPhone. He was making notes. Enough, comes a voice. Enough of what the thunder says. Enough of this fire and brimstone. Enough of this for now. Humanity has seen the robes and clothes of God's glory. Humanity has seen creation itself, for the heavens declare the glory of God. Now, says the voice from heaven, let me show humanity something far more wonderful. Let me show humanity my heart. And was there a still, small voice of an awesome silence? heaven, as that voice said, enough. The voice said to John, take the book from the angel, from the God messenger preaching from his world struggling pulpit. And the angel reaches out to John, and it's not a big book, it's now a booklet. For the whole story of God's glory is far too big for any of us to understand. But God can give us a booklet. God can tell us enough. And John walks to the angel and says, give it to me, please. And the angel gives it. And the angel gives it to John and says, eat it. Eat this book. Don't just take notes on the sermon. Eat it. Get it inside you. Let it transform you. Dwell on it. Mull over it. Chew it. Let it go deep into your soul. And John did it. 
He put away his notebook and pencil. He picked up his knife and fork. And he spiritually ate the book. And in the booklet, he found the stories of God's heart, which he will unpack in something of Revelation 12. And in that booklet, did it include perhaps an early copy of the Gospels, telling of God coming as man, born in Bethlehem? The Gospels telling us of Jesus walking in the midst of hurricanes and storms with us, not against us. The Gospels where Jesus rebukes the disciples for wanting to call judgment fire down from heaven. The Gospels with Jesus bidding all be patient to give people time to hear and change. The Gospels telling of how Moses and Elijah appeared to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration and whom we meet again in those two witnesses of chapter 11 that we read. The Gospels telling us of Christ suffering with us. The Gospels telling us of Jesus going through death with us. The Gospels telling of how Jesus was proved right in his resurrection. And the Pilots and Herods and evildoers of this world finally got met their comeuppance. Is this not far more wonderful than anything else that all creation can tell us? For here... We see God's heart, not God's clothes. Here we see the deepest inner glory of God that John in the Gospel of John so wonderfully unpacks for us, the weight of God's glory. If John and Revelation are written by the same person, we're not quite sure. But Revelation, as it were, was the vision, and then perhaps when John went on to write his Gospel to unpack that shorter booklet, as it were. And even in that gospel, as John says, the world is not big enough to contain it all. John knew the booklet was only a little bit of the book. Today, if you have known Christ and know Christ, that booklet is in your hand already. For God gave to you, symbolized in your baptism, symbolized in the coming of the Spirit into your heart, the privilege of proclaiming not God's clothes, but his heart. His clothes are scary for those who do not know his heart. But his heart is full of compassion and love. And once we know God's heart, then we begin to understand the rest. We sense the awe, not the fear. For our creator God is awesome. But we are not afraid of him. In the sense that sometimes that word is used. In the pandemic, someone came up to me on the street and said, all that is happening is God's judgment. Christ is coming soon. But Revelation tells us that that is nothing to do with us. We do not know when Christ is returning. Christ is always coming. And one day we will see God's full glory. But ours is not to speak of that. Ours is to proclaim the heart and compassion of God's love. Christ crucified. Christ resurrected Christ glorified God's grace and love the judgment belongs to God as Romans reminds us not to us as one wished critter the known God in his holiness and glory could have destroyed the world but God is full of grace angel of chapter 10 verse 1 wears a rainbow to you and me is given the privilege of saving humanity that booklet which is the message of your bible on that message hinges the salvation of the world it was that or the destruction of the flood 
And you and I do it with God's help. Don't worry, it does not all depend on you. If you and I do not respond, God has got other people who will respond. God will make sure the message gets out. But God offers you and me the privilege of sharing that good news that would bring thousands and millions of unnumbered people, as Romans tells us, into eternity. The wonderful privilege. And I can't wait for that moment in eternity when I will be able to go up to Keith and John and my maths teacher, Peanuts, what I owe to them in Christ. How through them I found Christ and through their witness to Jesus. They have taken the booklet and shared it. Will you?